Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. I'm your host, Roger Connect, President of Universal Accounting Center, and this is a podcast dedicated to individuals who are the owners of accounting, bookkeeping, and tax businesses. It's here that we talk about the things that you need to be aware of as you're offering quality services and getting paid what you're worth, but most importantly, taking care of your clients and giving them the accounting, bookkeeping, tax uh, services that they're needing to be successful. Now, as a podcast, we have on the show each and every week guests, experts in their own right to help us focus on the things that matter most. And today, is going to be exactly what you would like to experience with our show. Why? Because I've got another expert on here that I'm excited to have on. It's Scott Ritzheimer. Scott happens to have been one who started a business with nearly 20,000 new businesses and and nonprofits. He actually started a bookkeeping business and had 261 clients in the first year. He later founded Scale Architects to help founders and CEOs identify and implement the one essential strategy that they need right now to get them off to the fast track to predictable success. They actually uh, work on helping organizations develop and implement plans to scale like never before and sustain that success over the long haul. Through this, Scott actually gives them, their coaches, consultants, and so forth, the support they need to succeed while maintaining freedom and obviously a work balance. Now, he believes that in order to improve and cultivate organizational performance, that you need to have healthy leaders, happy employees, and satisfied stakeholders. So, Scott, welcome to the show. Roger, so excited to be here. Uh, I, I always get like a little moment right at the beginning of each podcast that uh, I get the opportunity to speak on because uh, a podcast actually changed the whole course and trajectory of my life. And so there's this moment of anticipation for me that ah, I hope it does that for somebody else, right? There's somebody listening to this. It's going to be just the right thing at just the right moment. You know, I've had many individuals actually share something similar to that, that there was a podcast, a moment, something that they heard that really caused them to stop, think and reevaluate things. And more importantly, become a catalyst to change what they're currently doing. And I agree with you. Perhaps this is going to be that exact episode for someone, because I think these topics we're going to talk about today rel- uh, resonate with me personally, and I think a lot of the listeners. So so I want to give some context and set the stage for this. You have a little bit of a background in accounting that I'd like to first emphasize. So let's start with how you got into the accounting profession and started your bookkeeping business. Yeah, so the accounting journey and the entrepreneurial journey are kind of one and the same, and they were totally by accident. Um, uh, I actually was trained in ministry, uh, of all things, and moved to Atlanta right after I got married at the ripe old age of 20 uh, to uh, to uh, be part of a, a ministry here in Atlanta and Beautiful. needed needed a job in the process, right? It was something yeah. that we were doing on a fully volunteer basis. And uh, I was like, I got to find some way to pay the bills. And uh, connected with a guy who was also associated with the ministry who helped uh, churches and nonprofits to deal with their tax and accounting paperwork. Uh, it was a big part of what they did, primarily like the Form 1023 and applying with the IRS and uh, you know things along those lines. And, uh, and so I started with him a couple months later, he sold the business Hmm. and, uh, to another group doing similar things. And I I watched as this business that he built was systematically, but unintentionally destroyed over about 18 month period. Oh my heavens. Uh, there were a lot of things that were wrong with the deal in terms of finance and everything. And it was just, it was bad for everybody. There was no villain in this. It, It just, it just failed. Uh, he had not built a sellable business. They had not bought a buyable business. Uh, there were mistakes all over the place. And I just had a front row seat of the whole thing. Uh, here's me, like, I'm just trying to get a job, you know, and, uh, and, and I'm just kind of watching it all unfold in real time. And, just the way that I'm wired, like if I'm in, I'm all in, right? So I was yeah. the low man on the totem pole in all of this. And by the end of that 18 month period, I was the one that everyone was asking questions because just the chaos and everything, like I was like, hey, we've got to make this thing work. We've got to make it work. Long story short, uh, he ends up getting the the company back. Uh, this is September, 2008. And uh, he, they call him, they say, hey, uh, we're going to declare bankruptcy on this, but if you want it, you can have it back. You can have, which having the company back was basically like five broken computers and one of those desk chairs where all the padding was worn out, you know? Uh, and, and so he's like, okay, I'll get it back. And from the U-Haul on his way up to, to get the last of the assets back, uh, he calls me and says, hey, there's not really anything left of this company. I mean, you know better than anyone where it's at. 
will you will you come back on as a co-founder with me and, and relaunch this thing? I think we can make it work. Wow. So September 2008, that's what we do. Uh, we, we started from worse than nothing uh, because there was a whole bunch of folks that had paid the other company that because not, not because they were ill-intentioned, but the work just didn't happen. And it was just this really messy situation. There was receivables for local vendors that hadn't been paid. And so we started off with uh, this time, this wasn't the, the a bookkeeping business. But with this business doing the form 1023s, we started off with 250 clients and no revenue, right? It was, it was the wrong version of starting off with a bunch of clients. Uh, and so we really had to scramble to not only just build this business to sell something, but to also service folks that were associated with our name because the, the company name had carried through all of it. And then September 2008 happens, right? It's like the worst possible time to start a business. The first six months, stock market drops by 32%. We got all these clients who need work. We're trying to make something from nothing. And it was glorious. Like it was it was just magical, right? It was awful in all these ways. But there's something about those early days as an entrepreneur where it's just like, yeah, nothing's going the way that I want it to, right? Like, uh, like how's it going? It's great. You know, like we have the entrepreneur smile. But it, but it is going great too, right? Like we were, we we're working from a basement. We we're getting letters from the HOA. Like there were just problems all over the place, but none of that mattered because we at least had a shot now. And I, and I think that's a big part of it for entrepreneurs. I know it was for me is like, hey, this might not work. I have no idea what I'm doing. For me, I was early 20s at this time but we're going to give it a shot. And, and we did, and it, it worked. Uh, we, we had a ton of success. Um, folks listening to this can probably relate. Uh, I was, I, I was all in. So I was reading IRS publications on vacation, you know, like it was just, you know, like that, that was just life back then. Like you didn't go on vacation. You just were at different places. And, yeah. uh, and so I was reading publication 517. It, 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 the list goes on. Um, but we, we quickly had to start building a team again because we had all these clients and, and, and I got thrown right into the deep end of, hey, starting a business is not being good at whatever it is that you do. That's an element. It's a necessary one. But I had to learn really quickly that it was not about what I could do. It was about how I could manage other people. And I, frankly, I hated that. Right. Like that, that was really hard for me because other people don't keep up with you. They don't think like you do. Uh, they don't own it like you do. Right. There's That's a problem. Right. And they're just like, here's the problem. It's like, well, what in the world do I pay you for? You know, and I was young and dumb and mean and you know, all of those things. Like, I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, and and largely the, the organization grew despite me, but had to learn very early on that 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 shift from hey, I'm starting a business to I'm actually growing a business meant I had to shift modes. I didn't have language for it at the time. And I don't even know that there was a distinct moment that it happened. But I remember more and more, I was spending more and more of my energy getting other people to do things than getting mm -hmm. to do my real work, right? That was a really hard transition for me. Uh, and it probably, you know, it probably could have taken about six months. I think it probably took about six years to really do that well to where I was like, oh, this is actually my job. This is what I'm supposed to do. Uh, but anyway, that company grew. It did really well. We were having double and triple digit growth. We never really applied for the Inc. 5000, but would have been in the top thousand for most of, uh, of my time there. And, uh, and, and it was just, it was a really cool experience. Um, and uh, so we're just trying to fast forward a little bit during that time, uh, we're helping all these nonprofits, churches, and, and even some businesses, and we were starting them really well. And then they were falling off and we're like, mm -hmm. well, what's going on? Like their finances were a mess. Their teams were a mess. It was just, it was this, it was a huge problem. And so we decided to launch a bookkeeping company alongside uh, our, our existing company. And, uh, and that's where I really entered into the world of accounting um, and not just kind of the tax prep side of things. Uh, and so we were doing bookkeeping, tax prep, and then we partnered with a CPA firm to do audits, independent audits, uh, where that was appropriate. And uh, it was like, it was a whole different animal, right? Like, you know, working with accounting and like working with clients on an ongoing basis, the scalability was unbelievable. It was super, super cool what we could do from a recurring standpoint. But that meant that the problem scaled really quickly too, right? Yep. And it was it was just trial by fire early on. Um, but we became one of the biggest nonprofit bookkeeping firms in the company in just a, a year or two. Uh, and again, it, it I kind of thought I had it figured out before that, but I realized in that mode, especially leading multiple companies, 
I didn't really even have the time to like be the manager. I actually had to have other people managing most of what was going on in the firm. And I had to step into a different role that I really did not understand. Uh, and, and it was about this time, uh, just to come full circle here with the story, and then I'll stop monologuing, but um, <laughs> the uh, come full circle on the story and, and where I opened up, I was, I was really struggling, right? All the numbers looked good from the outside, especially from a revenue standpoint, but with a bookkeeping company and all this, we we're doing all these new things. Our profitability was just plummeting internally. Uh, it was this three year period where we went from the mid 20% margins all the way down into like the mid, you know, single digits. And it wasn't for not trying to fix it. So not only was it falling, we were doing everything we knew to fix it. And it wasn't working. And I'm driving to work uh, one day, super, super frustrated. Uh, it's just nothing we try is fixed. Every year we're going to double our profit margin and every year we have it was basically what was happening. And, uh, and so I'm listening to this podcast and a guy with a funny Irish accent, he's a dear friend of mine now, but he comes on, he starts talking about um, you know, how we need to change both as leaders and as organizations as we grow. What creates success at one stage invariably is what causes problems at the next stage. And it was the very first time that I felt as an entrepreneur that I was on a map that somebody had actually done what we had done and knew the journey ahead of us. And uh, and, and from that point on, I just became a, a student of a lot of his work, really gave myself to understanding, hey, how do I have to change how I show up? How do we have to change how we show up? It unlocked just a whole new level of growth for us and ultimately paved the way for me to help others do that, which is what I do now at Scale Architects. I love this. No, you've covered so many things on here that I want to touch on. I'm just going to point out a few things that I'd like to actually revisit, but I'm going to start with the last. Uh, eventually, I'd like to come back and discuss the ministry and the work that you were doing there. But as a young 20-year-old, having the successes that you were having, one of the things that I can relate to is in my 20s, I started to recognize the age no longer mattered. And what I meant by that is all of a sudden in my 20s, I was managing individuals that were many years my senior. They were in their 40s, 50s, 60s. And I was in a situation of managing them and quickly had to realize that age was irrelevant. It was my maturity, my ability to professionally and personally interact with these people to help them succeed and, and motivate them. But then you also got into this whole idea of working through others, recognizing with the explosive growth that you were experiencing, that you had to relinquish and expect of other individuals that they can move the needle because you had so many things that you were responsible for. And so that delegation became something that was essential to your success and something that I've also experienced that all of a sudden, it's not that you're the doer, it's you're the person that gets things done through other people. And it's motivating, directing, guiding them, keeping them on task, making it clear to them what that key objective is so that they can deliver and be successful. So that clarity is something that you have to refine and become much better at. But then you ultimately ended by talking about how you now, through your services, focus on what founders experience as they go through various stages or levels in the business and how their roles adapt and change and how the preceding one does impact the subsequent one. So there's a lot here I want to digest. So let's kind of now move into what your role is now, because I think this is really, really fascinating. It's the founder's evolution. And it's yeah. these various stages that we go through as business owners growing our businesses. Some of them are revenue specific. Some of them are size specific. But what we're talking about here is essentially our growth is an individual as a leader, we're going yeah. to go through certain evolutions. And so yeah. let's just real quickly lay them out. And rather than diving too deep into any of them, let's first of all, set the stage by indicating what are those levels that we can anticipate experiencing as we grow our companies? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's seven of them. Uh, mm -hmm. And it can be a mouthful in a podcast setting. So we're going <laughs> to work through these pretty quickly. Slow, slow. Uh, 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 what I want to do is we'll, we'll kind of hit each one. They go from pre-launch to post-exit. So that's the yep. context. Uh, interestingly enough, it's the same leadership journey that everyone goes through. It's just the the exact expression that founders face. And there's some nuances to that. And one of those nuances is really important to kind of set the stage for why this matters, is that for founders, when these stages change, there's nothing to externally validate that like there is for, let's say, an employee. 
right? Okay. So you can take an employee and they move from being a, a, a solo contributor, right? I'm an accountant to I'm an accountant lead. I, I lead a group of people who do accounting. Uh, there's a new, that's a new challenge, right? Leading other people is different than just making sure your T charts balance. So I don't know if we do that anymore, but like, you, you know, like it's just a different skill set. And, uh, and so that's hard enough as it is. There's entire, you know, coaching professions built, built on it. There's a, a half the book industry is about that, that transition. Uh, and, and so even when you have the title change to say that there's a shift, right? Even when somebody else says, Hey, the game is changing. Here's what you need to do to succeed. It's actually so really, really hard to do, right? It's really hard to make that shift from individual contributor to a, a, a manager effectively, uh, yeah. and a leader in some sense. So when does that happen? And what are these stages that they'll experience? Right. And so, and that's just one example of basically seven, right? Where there's no clear demarcation point uh, within your organization. Now there are signs and we can go through those and, and we'll touch on those for each, uh, each of the stages. But I just want to lay out if you're, if you're feeling like I've never thought about this before as a founder, it's because Nobody tells you about this, right? Like nobody, there's no one who says, uh, another just quick example, and then we'll get to the stages, I promise, is okay. what is the title that most people put on their business card, right? Again, I don't know that we really do business cards anymore, but what's the, the <laughs> title out of the gate before you've even started? It's founder and CEO or something like that, right? The reality of it is you're not actually a CEO if you're the only employee at the business. You know, it's you might have that title, you might have the authority of CEO, but you're not in the role of a CEO. To be the chief executive, you have to have other executives. That doesn't happen until stage five, right? So even something as simple as our title betrays the fact that how we show up is very different over time. All right enough context. What does that mean? Starts before we start and, and what I call the dissatisfied employee. When you look at most founders journeys, especially successful founders and, and founders who want to scale their organization, right? So want it to be more than just a job. There's nothing wrong with that. We'll talk about yes. that in a moment. But as we go through these stages, most they, they apply um, especially the later stages apply to those who are going that far in the process. You don't have to go that far. It's not inherently better to go far, but you, you'll understand a little bit more as we get into it. But for those who start and are successful, there's this, there's this time that they spend before they launch where they're just frustrated by, by the way things are, right? There, there's just something in them that says, there's got to be a better way. The defining question for them is, isn't there a better way? It might be a better way to serve customers. It might be a better way to have more freedom and autonomy. It might be a better way of doing accounting or structuring your service offering. There's just something in them that's like, ah, like I, I have to do it, right? I have to start my own business. Uh, even when you look at accidental entrepreneurs, similar to myself, there's the same moment when you look back and it's like, oh, I see what led me there. I was not going to be satisfied in a traditional role. Mm -hmm. And that dissatisfaction is really important because uh, for a couple of reasons. One, starting your own business is really hard right? And, and we unfortunately live in an era that glorifies entrepreneurship and seems to make it look really easy. And it, it's not actually. The failure rate is every bit as high, if not higher now than it was 50 years and 500 years ago for new businesses. Most, 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 vast majority of them fail. And so we actually need a period of discomfort to make it worth getting through the discomfort of being a founder. And so there's actually a really important role to that. And a lot of us, because we don't like being uncomfortable, especially here in the West, we try and just breeze through that. The moment we think, oh, I can start my own business, we just go out and start it. But we find ourselves woefully unprepared and out of our depth, and it can cause a whole lot of problems later on. So dissatisfied employee is stage number one. Okay. And, uh, and it leads us to ultimately that dissatisfaction builds up. Uh, and we can talk about why not every dissatisfied employee is a founder, but let's say for the founders, it builds to a point where they just can't ignore it anymore. They go, they're going to hang their shin shingle, they make the leap. Stage yeah. two is one of the more obvious transitions, and it's when you go full time. So it's not a side hustle. It's not a hobby anymore. It's like, hey, I'm going to make my living doing this. That's when you step into stage two, and I call that the startup entrepreneur. 
And uh, the, the the defining question for a startup entrepreneur is a little funny, but it's like, uh, like what was I thinking? <laughs> you know, like, this is not what the, the, that Instagram told me entrepreneurism was. It's, it's harder, right? You, you will take more rejection and hits and setbacks in, in the first two years of starting a business than most people will in two lifetimes if you're doing it right, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and that's not even if you're doing it wrong. It could be worse or, or you can just kind of sh- shuffle it all under the, the carpet. It, but if you're doing this thing right, you've got to push through. You got to break through. You're creating something from nothing. Uh, you're creating momentum from nothing, right? And and that takes an enormous amount of work. It's not dissimilar to a rocket launch, right? When you watch these rocket launches, all the engines fire as soon as they go T minus five, four, three, two, one, zero. But the thing doesn't move right away. It just sits there and shudders on the launch pad for a moment. That's a lot of what this stage feels like. And the thing that we have to do in this stage is is have a ruthless focus on, hey, what do I need to do to grow my business? And, and, And that's what do I need to sell and deliver? sell and deliver. And we actually need to simplify the formula as much as we can. We get distracted and and it causes us all kinds of problems. And so those that succeed in this player, this, they, they succeed by being a star player, by being really good at, at selling, right? Attracting and performing, delivering. Not the best at, it's almost never the people who are best at either of those. It's those who are good enough at both of them it, it are, are who, who get out of the gate the fastest or have a team that's good enough at both of those, which is a little less common. Before you go to three, I've got a few comments on one and two. Yes. Fire away. All right. So first of all, regarding number one, I see a lot of individuals in that space. Michael Gerber, as many people would refer to it as that technician having the entrepreneurial seizures. You have a skill, something that someone's willing to pay for. You do it on weekends. You're doing it on weeknights. It's outside of the work because you access have access to the tools, the equipment, and somebody needs your expertise. It's the bookkeeper. It's the mechanic. It's the doctor that's actually doing things on the side. That's all fine and dandy. But what also happens is, like you explained, there is a transition where you say, okay, this is no longer going to be a hobby. I'm going to make this official. I may go get my business license at this point, but I'm going to go hang my shingle and actually walk away from my W-2 or really seriously go go about growing what I'm doing here. But you're still in a job phase. There's no employee. It's all up to you. You're going to be doing it all. And so in these first few phases, what we're really doing is recognizing that our role is growing, but we're still in a job mentality. If it's going to be done, we've got to do it. And so that's where as a founder, we've got to recognize that we are hustling. We are having to actually get things done. But there is something to having a business. It's not just the business license and the company name that matters. It's the fact that you now have not just a process, a system, a product, a service, but you now have employees. You have other individuals that are now involved in delivering that. And so I like how this is evolving simply because I think it's an evolution that many of my listeners can can relate to. So yes. let's continue. Yeah, and you're exactly right. So what happens when you play the game really well, right? You, you do the things you need to do. You get into entrepreneur mode. You hustle. There's grit. There's determination. Like you get stuff done. And as you get stuff done, you realize, uh, you know, I, I can't actually get all this stuff done. I, I need more help. And so the more that you you succeed, the more ha- help come you, you bring in and you, you wake up one morning and, and kind of everything's going well. But that Monday morning, you wake up and and the prevailing thought in your mind is, what's wrong with these people? Right? They don't think like I do. They don't act like I do. They don't take ownership like I do. Wonderful people. I hired them. I chose them. But like... I like I have way more problems now than I did when I didn't have all of these people, right? And let's be real, many times I had more money when I didn't have all of these people, right? Because especially in the beginning, every new hire is coming right out of your bottom line. It's coming out of your paycheck, right? And and so you many folks will find them, especially in in professional services, you'll find yourself making less money with five employees than you did with none or one. Right. And so you're sitting there thinking like, what's up with this? I've got all these people. They should be making my life easier. But instead, I got to sell four times as much to feed all of them. And they keep coming to me with all their problems and they won't just solve them. Right. Like there's this frustration that starts to build. And this is one of those stages where going from stage two to stage three is not an upgrade. 
right? Not in the the expression and feel of what life is like as a founder. Uh, it's that same challenge that I faced early in my journey when I realized I couldn't succeed by just doing this stuff myself. I had to start managing a team around me. They will not manage themselves, right? Uh, and, and we want them to, we'd love them to, but the reality of it is like, they're not all wired like you and they shouldn't be wired like you. Because if they were, they would either be your competitor or you'd be running around, I uh, heard this uh, saying recently, your business strategy would look like drunk kids on jet skis, right? Like, it's just like, it's everyone in every direction, like that's not the way to build a business. And so there's this recognition that we have that, oh, I, I actually, have, these people need to be managed. And that means I have to manage them. And that's the last thing that I want to do. And, and, and tell me if you've ever bumped into one of these people, because I haven't, and I'd love to meet one. I've never met somebody when I said, hey, why did you start your business? And they said, I really wanted to manage a team of employees. <laughs> well, right? it's, it's no different than somebody saying I started the business because I wanted to do accounting. That's only what the accountant says. Everyone right, else doesn't right, start right. the business for that so, reason. But no founder, right, who's going to get through those first stages and build something that requires uh, other employees did it so that they could manage other employees. It's just, it's not why we started. I mean, you look at survey after survey after survey, they might want to create jobs, right? They might want to uh, create a company or a vision or there's or, or have freedom and autonomy. There's all kinds of things that do it. And many of them require employees. But we find ourselves in this really uncomfortable stage that I call the reluctant manager. I know I have to manage these folks, but I really wish I didn't have to. If I'm honest, I, I wish that they would just manage themselves. I don't understand why they need all, I don't understand why they have all these questions. I don't understand why they don't think like I do. I don't understand why they don't make decisions like I do. And we walk around with this chip on our shoulder thinking that something is wrong with our, 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 our staff, our people. There's something kind of fundamentally wrong with them and right with us. And the, the, there is actually some merit to that thought. And, and the reason why is because you probably hired at least half the wrong people, right? There's, there's an intuitive, like, it shouldn't be this hard to manage someone. And mm -hmm. it's actually true. There's a specific type of person that is very effective at this stage. And there are three specific types of people that are not, right? So the odds are kind of against you. If you're just <laughs> haphazardly hiring people who either have a pulse or are related to you, you're probably going to get it wrong more than you get it right. And, uh, and, and then the folks that you should be hiring are different than you. So that means you have to find a way of separating between folks who aren't like you, but are the right people and folks who aren't like you and are the wrong people. And that is a skill set that we are not born with, right? It's something that we have to develop and learn and embrace to really achieve the next level. You know, some of the things that you're describing here are ones that I relate to very much because I exp I have these conversations with my clients as they're uh, sharing with me their experience starting the business, hiring employees, their frustrations as they interact with these employees. It's something that I describe back to them as if being a parent. And as I go through this narrative, they start to find their story of running the business as being a parent. And let me just share it real quickly. And it's essentially when you first get a child and you're excited to now have that newborn in the family, it seems fun and dandy until you have the long nights, you're changing the diapers, you're dealing with the baby spitting up on you. But then the child grows older and you have the terrible twos. They throw things at you. They they don't like you. They're, they're frustrated. They hit you. Well, the point is, is as the business is pushing back at you, it's no different than this child. And the reason why you had the child is because you wanted a terrible two. The reason why you had a child is because you saw the value in family and you knew under and knew and understood that there's something greater than this. And what comes is this child who eventually loves you unconditionally. And it's that five-year-old, that six-year-old who, when you arrive home, runs to greet you at the door because they're finally excited that you've arrived. Nowhere else in life do you go when somebody just gets up and runs to you and just in open arms embraces you. That love is what going on here and you're building an organization that will see you as such but the point is is you have to go through these growing pains and when i put into that context many of the individuals i work with start to see like their family their business is that very same thing that they love unconditionally and they're going to give their heart and souls to why because they see that in like a child you're you're building a self-sustaining living entity that will eventually be autonomous from you and that's what we're growing towards through these stages as, a, as we go through the founder stages so let's go to the next level with level four. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So we think, all right, 
I'm going to embrace the manager thing and that's going to take me to the next level. And then things are going to be okay, right? Uh, it's going to be great. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it's a little different than that. And to to kind of explain why, I like to share uh, a move, uh, an example from uh, that'll kind of bring some family stuff into it. So we had uh, at the time, this is a couple of years ago now, we had like, uh, I think it was, uh, it was 10, 8, and 0 year old, right? So we had a, a, a new, uh, new, new little born. girl. Yeah. Yep. And, and so we're in newborn mode. And um, we we did not get out as a couple very often during that season, right? Because it's just the needs were so different. Yeah. They weren't old enough to like watch themselves. And it was yep. just really hard. So we kind of move heaven and earth one day. We get a babysitter that we know like has relationship with the eight and 10 year old. And so that's going to be okay. Loves the, you know, not loves a newborn. So that's going to be okay. Like, I think this is going to work. And in a, a triumphant moment of romanticism, we decide dinner in a movie, right? <laughs> like that's, that's what we're going to do. Good go-to. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's around the time that top, the second top uh, gun is coming out Maverick. Uh, and it's kind of, and it's cool. Like we're watching the beginning and it's like the retro song. It's like, I remember it from my childhood and it's just awesome. You know, Tom Cruise still looks the exact same that he did like 80 years ago. I don't know how that's possible, but we're watching through the movie, uh, having a, a nice night and about, you know, 20 minutes with uh, left of the movie, we get a call from the babysitter, SOS, the, the zero year old won't, you know, won't fall asleep. The, the, the older two, the boys are, are fighting downstairs. Like you need to come like, uh, and so, uh, if we didn't see the end of top, uh, top gun Maverick for like two years after that, because I mean, there's definitely not a time for me to watch it at home. You know, it was like, we're way too busy for that. So, if you, but if you stop the movie right there, just about everything that can go wrong for Tom has, right? Uh, he, he's on an impossible mission and it's not the Mission Impossible movie. So we don't know if it's going to work, right? He, he hasn't got the girl yet. Uh, he's being rejected by his boss and employer. He's being, you know, the whole world is telling him it's moved on and, and it's better. He's got relational problems with, you know, his former wingman's son. Uh, he's been shot down two or three times, I think, at this point. Like, it's, it's just bad for Tom. He's got helicopters chasing him. And if you take any great movie and you just play it forward to when there's about 15 or 20 minutes left, that's the same story. Everything that can go wrong does go wrong. And uh, unfortunately, the fourth stage in the journey feels a lot like that. Right. Uh, and, and I call it the disillusioned leader. And, and the reason for that is when we start uh, and what carries us through are usually some component of vision for the future. Right. We think if I can get to a million dollars or ten million dollars or a hundred million dollars or five or five employees or 20 employees, like whatever it is, uh, if you're in financial services, this number of assets under management or we, we set these milestones that are actually entirely arbitrary. Like there's nothing actually different and accountants will respect this. There's nothing different from nine hundred ninety nine thousand right? And a million, right? There, there, there's nothing materially different about those two things other than a single digit. But we have this idea that when we cross these thresholds, things are going to get better. We think that as businesses grow, they inherently get better. That's why they're worth building bigger businesses. And we find out that businesses do get bigger, but they don't get better on their own right? Those, those terrible twos, those five-year-olds that used to come running to you, they're now teenagers. And, and it's just, you, you enter this season where the complexity builds up so much, right? And it's sometimes uh, between the range of 25 and 75 employees, it varies really widely, but you've got people around and, and they all have different needs. Uh, I remember one distinct moment during this time where, I mean, we really cared about our team members. And anytime someone would go through some kind of crisis, like we would come together as a leadership team and say, hey, what can we do to help them? And we had three leadership team meetings in a row where basically all we talked about were the crises that our team members were going through. And we're like, what's going on? We're being attacked here. Like there's, there's like, is there someone like coming after us? Like what's going on? And we realized, no, no, no one's attacking us. You, you take a, a group of people and at any given time, about 10% of them are going to be in some measure of crisis, right? Mm -hmm. And if you've got 50 people around, then that means you've got five people in crisis at any given point in time. That's just here to stay. We can't dedicate entire leadership team meetings to it because we'll never do anything else. Just a small example. 
uh, the, the challenge we had with profitability and just the complexity of changing that, you change one factor and two more would pop up. And, and I remember like these, we'd pass these milestones, uh, or whatever they were, a million dollar month, a million dollar year, $10 million. And it was kind of like, well, now what? You, you know, like, why am I actually doing this? And the the illusions, frankly, that we had of what becoming an entrepreneur was are starting to unfold in front of us. And and we look back in the rearview mirror, back a stage to reluctant manager. That was actually harder than the stage before. We look all the way back to that startup entrepreneur. And it's like, that was hard, but at least I was making good money and I had some freedom, right? At least I yeah. could do things myself. And we start making judgment calls about, am I good enough to do this, right? Is this it? Like, is this really as far as this company is going to go? Is this really what leading a bigger business is like? We're down uh, 20 minutes from the end of the movie, right? And we're starting to see, I can see the trajectory of this. Like it's down into the right, not up into the right. Like it just keeps feeling worse. The, the bigger and more successful I get, the harder it seems like it is. And, uh, and if we're not careful, we'll make really life altering decisions during this time, right? Some folks will sell their business, some folks will take it back. Those aren't inherently wrong. But if they're done for the wrong reasons, they can be really damaging. And, and what I, I always tell folks in this disillusioned leader stage is, just like the movie, you're only one step away from actually the biggest single transformation in your journey as a founder. It's it's one step away. It's a big step. It's a it's a, it has to be done intentionally. There's meaning and purpose behind it. But what you'll find is where you feel like you're drifting further and further from who you are and how you best engage with the organization. You feel like you're pulled in a thousand different directions. When you get to stage five, that thousand becomes five. Right. It it is it, it's just a dramatic transformation. And so many founders that I meet, especially if this happens before we have an opportunity to work together, they get up to that line, they feel the pain of being shot down and being chased by a helicopter like Tom, and they're like, I'm done. Like I, I just, I, I'm going to go back to what I remember from the past, an earlier stage, or I'm going to sell, or I'm going to reduce this all the way down to when it's just back to me because I, I'm not doing anything that I love anymore. And those are all valid options and, and, and they're not even the wrong choice, but there is another choice. And that is to step into that fifth stage, which I call the chief executive, to really step into the role of CEO for the first time. And when you do, it's, it's, it's very intimidating. Dating. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to you know, make it fluffy and flowery. It, it's, a, it's a new set of skills. You kind of find yourself on the sideline like, what do I do with my hands? You know, like a Ricky Bobby uh -huh. thing. Uh -huh. That's uh, exactly but, right. But, but when you start to embrace that role and what it really is and what it really means, you'll find that it's actually highly aligned with the way that most founders think and feel and act and add value. And so when while you can only survive stages three and four, you know, joyfully for a very short period of time. We'll come back to that later. But you can really only survive those for a few years each, right? And then you're just like, I'm out. Like, I've had enough. This is not worth it. Yeah. Most folks who get into that CEO role and really do it the right way, who get into the real version of chief executive, not just the title, but the, the actual role, that stage, they can, they can thrive there for 5, 10, 15, 50 years, some of them. That's right. And you just find this new stride and it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. You know, one of the things that I've really enjoyed about the podcast that I've done is I get to share the stories that you're kind of emulating here through these founder stages. People do share these stories. And just like the movie, people go through these times where there are a lot of uncertainties and challenges and they don't know how they're going to overcome them, but yet they do. And the thing that I really like about the transition into that CEO stage is it's very akin to what I would describe as being a quarterback. As a quarterback, you're on the field calling the shots, you're making the plays, you're making things happen, you're involved in the actual game. But there comes a moment where it's time for you to take the sideline and be the coach. And as the coach, you don't get to step on the field. As the coach, you don't get to actually make a difference as to what's happening on that field. You have to key, have key individuals with whom you trust and you work through to accomplish the goals that you're having. And so that CEO role is you standing on the sideline going, what do I do with my hands? I don't know what to do with my hands because you're not on the field any longer. You've got yeah. other individuals that you need to be supporting so that they can make things happen. And that's yeah. that powerful change. Now, time is fleeting from us. We've got now two more to go. Tell us about this fifth stage, but just real quickly introduce the sixth and seventh. 
Yeah, so we can we can move a little quicker through them uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they're very natural progressions from one to the next, right? What's happened is you've done so much of the legwork that if you really embrace each of the stages, as opposed to just trying to avoid them, which doesn't work, or just trying to race through them, which causes a lot of false starts, if you really embrace each of these stages, one, two, three, four, and five, uh, it sets the stage one for just a really, really wonderful stage in your career, right? Uh, you'll make more money. You'll do it with less effort. It's just a really beautiful thing. You're still actively involved in the affairs of the organization. You're still making decisions. You're leading a team, um, but you're not you're not trying, you're not there like in every single moment dealing with every single problem anymore. You have teams who do that for you. CEO is a beautiful, beautiful stage. And what happens when you get there, right? And you, and you do that role properly is it actually prepares you to step out of that and into stage six, which I call the true owner. And the reason why this is stage six, not stage three, right? Which a lot of us want. We want to yep. go from like, hey, I started it to now someone else owns, like does everything and I just magically own it. Um, it, it just doesn't work that way, right? You can't skip from stage two to stage six. You have to go through each of them. Uh, if you do, you will either tragically stunt the growth of your organization, uh, Put yourself in a, a, a probability that's highly unlikely, right? You know, it's not can or can't, but it's like 99% versus, you know, 19% uh, success rate. And, and so when you really step into the CEO role and you shed the rest of the roles you've been hanging on to and delegate them to the appropriate people inside the organization, you build a scalable organization, your, your ability to have success in succession goes through the roof right? You don't even have to sell anymore. You actually have built an organization that you can hand off to somebody else to continue to not only manage it, but lead it and grow it into the future while you own it. And, and it's, it's it, again, it's, uh, there's so much that we could unpack in there, but the, the prerequisite to stepping into true owners that you really have to do CEO stage well. And, and this, a similar thing happens when you become true owner, you find yourself uh, another kind of Ricky Bobby moment, right? Like now, really, what do I do? You know, because it's like, you're not even, you don't even have a job anymore, but you've got money and and you know, and time. Like we've either had money or time all our life. Now we have both. What do we do with it? And, and there's usually a great, great argument to just relax for a little while, like play some golf, like gallivant the world, you know, get the grandkids in your lap, like just have a good time. But eventually that founder thing starts coming back, right? And it's like, ah, there's this itch that we've got to scratch. And what you see for the very best of the best is that they take the, all of the opportunity and luxury of, uh, of stage six, the true owner, and this is whether they sell or hold. Uh, that That's not actually a material difference at this point. But they use all the resource that they have to get back into the game, not because they need to make more money, but because they get to. And they step into the visionary founder role. And it's where you, you kind of achieve that hall of fame status uh, where you're actually contributing to the, the betterment of others to how the game is played and making your real mark and legacy on the world in stage seven. What you're describing here is, I think, something everyone kind of aspires or wants. They want to see that culmination. It's that legacy that they've built, and at the end, they get to enjoy. But what I really uh, see is a lot of people struggle moving from one stage to the next, letting go and moving to that next level. And really, it's it's self-imposed. It's one of those things that individuals are, they're holding themselves back from making that next uh, step. Would you agree? Absolutely. And, and I would say... It, um, they just don't know, right? Like the, 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 here's the, the paradox behind all of it is that the better you are in one stage, the faster you're thrust into the next stage, but the more you cling to the strategies that worked in the previous stage right? That's the paradox mm -hmm. of it. So what happens is we have a ton of success, right? We're having success in all these stages. Otherwise, you're not growing. You're not moving to the next level, right? You've got a bigger organization in stage four than you did in stage three. And, and uh, we're not talking about how you validate success. It's whatever it is to you. Uh, but you're having more of it than you did before, but it's less fulfilling than it was before. Like, what, what's up with that? Yeah. Uh, and so 
what happens is because we don't know that the change is made, we don't have sidelines. Use your coach analogy. I actually extend that uh, quite extensively in the book. Uh, we, we, we show how each of the stages relates to a position. But because we don't have sidelines as founders, we just keep jumping back onto the field, right? We, we keep interrupting in the play. We're frustrating all of our people. We're getting hit in the process. So we kind of, we're, we're laying there on the ground, bruised and hurting, uh, you know, and that's that hurts a lot more at 50 than it does at 15 when you were doing this in middle school, you know, like yep. it's just, and we're wondering like, why is it so hard? Why does it hurt so much? It's because you're not playing your role. You know, like you don't have to do that. You can step to the sidelines. So, so much much of it is just they don't know. And in the absence of knowing that the stage has changed, they continue to do what worked in the past and it doesn't serve them well. You know, that's one of the reasons why I love your stages as a founder, because these things clearly do matter. And if you understand your role as the founder and how you can move from each of these, it can be a much more comfortable transition. So that's one yeah. of the things that I really like about what you're sharing here. So I mentioned at the beginning that you brought up something that I wanted to circle back at the end. And I'm going to do that right now. As we're wrapping things up, I want to ask, how does faith, especially as you went through and, and were going into the ministry, how does faith play into this? And where do you see its application? Yeah. Uh, for me, I can't divorce the two. I was, it, it, they are one and the same. I think, you know, for me as a Christian, um, it, it's really important. Where I can say it comes front and center for everybody is by stage five, that chief executive role, because you cannot embrace that role without being confident in who you are right? It, it shocks people to know this, but when what the biggest resistance to you stepping into that stage five CEO that I talked about is not the title, right? It's not even the team. It is your own ego that gets in the way, right? It's your own identity that is so intrinsically knit to the organization at that stage that to become CEO, you actually have to lead a business that isn't you. And that means you have to define what is you. If you take your business away, what are you? And that's that's really hard to do. And so for me, faith is it's a crucial component for all of these. But uh, I don't know how you get through stage five without it, right? I, I really don't. It's it's so hard, so challenging, so existentially threatening to our ego that if we don't have something like faith that we can look to, to to give us a true sense of our identity, to help us understand what we really value, uh, for me, those those two are are necessary counterparts, especially at that stage. You know, I appreciate you sharing that. The way I would relate it is this. Um, when you are in that leadership role, the CEO level, let's say, the big part becomes that of your ability to serve. And one of the things that I uh, will say to individuals is your success is my success. And so it is the master coming down and serving even the lowest of individuals to help them feel valued, appreciated, that they have a purpose, a place within the organization, that their contribution does matter. And once you help individuals see that they have that self-worth, they're able to more confidently go about their job. And so I do see your role as the CEO as taking on that type of relationship. And if you can actually go to your faith, particularly that of a Christian faith and see how the master did that. I think we can learn so much and apply those same principles with our employees. So mm -hmm. love to add that in there. Uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wrap this up. We're, we've gone long on our time and we need to finish, but I'm going to just kind of point out a few things. First of all, there is an excellent offer here for our listeners that I'd like you to take advantage of. In the episode description, you'll find that Scott is actually providing a way to learn these seven stages. You can get access to a free download copy of the Founders Evolution. And I encourage you to go to the episode description and get your copy of it. It's basically going to help you see where you are and what that next stage for you will be. And I think you'll be able to relate very well to the journey that you've already been on as it comes th comes out through the book. In addition to that, I want to invite you to take advantage of the other free resources that are available there, particularly the book called In the Black, Nine Principles to Make Your Business Pro Pro Profitable. It is a book that you want to actually use as it helps you identify the nine things you need to be working on in your business to ensure the profitability of your company. Now, as I kind of wrap things up here. I'm going to come back for a closing thought, but I want to point out first and foremost that I loved at the beginning his story of early on kind of being thrust into business. I think sometimes we as we go through our careers find that 
opportunity presents itself and times it's thrust sometimes it's thrust at us and he clearly embraced that and through that evolution he started to realize that really with all the growth in in expanse he needed to identify how he could work best through others and it was through that identification that he was able to take off i would assume the shackles that of uh, i need to do it myself if i want it done right it's got to be done by me he was able to actually delegate and through that clarity help people actually get things done correctly the other thing i'd like to point out is through this evolution, he was obviously able to identify these stages that are so relevant to what we all experience in our business and articulate them so well so as to help us understand that we do actually have a path, a path to success and ultimately that of becoming an owner and it really in the end exiting with a lot of success if we're willing to embrace each of these levels and transition from one to the next. So I really appreciate him sharing those little things in relevant ways that we can identify uh, with them today. The other thing I'd like to point out is this idea of faith. Uh, With your faith, if you can actually take how you practice your beliefs and bring them into the office, not in a preachy way, but in the fact of applying the principles that you hold dear in life, basically bringing them into the work world, I think it actually changes the relationships we have with our customers. It changes the relationships that we have with our employees when we see them the way we ought to see them, which is divine individuals. And so that's very important for us. And so with that being said, Scott, what do you have as a final thought? Yeah, uh, uh, just uh, a final thing in closing, and this is particularly true for those that are kind of in the middle of this journey, uh, that three, four, five stage. Uh, the, the other day, I decided I was going to be like super dad, right? And uh, and have uh, dinner taken care of, and everyone was going to be wonderful. I was going to cook, and and it was all there. And my wife's like, hey, I don't think that's a great idea. Like, we have three kids. We live life wide open. Like, why don't you just take us out to eat? And I'm like, no, no, no I got this, right? Because for me, for some reason, being a dad meant I had to also be a chef. Long story short, uh, she comes home a couple hours later after I've been at the grocery store like three times and like triple paid on what I need to have for it. The kids are like, it's chaos. The food is literally on fire and I've, I'm just melting down, right? Just everything wrong about it. And uh, after after some you know, br- brief words, uh, the you know, cooler heads prevail and we just decide to go and 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 eat out. And so uh, we head out and she's like, and she, you know, on the way, she's like, I told you we should have done this. You know, it's like, and she was right. She deserved to, to say that. Uh, and we actually, we actually had a wonderful night. Uh, they, they brought the food. It was delicious. Everyone got what they wanted. The kids uh-huh. were happy. We were happy. And uh, it, it helped me to recognize that to be a great dad, I didn't have to be a great chef right? Like I, I just, there are oh, was one or two things that I had to do. I had to be present for my kids. I had to be present for my wife. Uh, I had to pour into them to lead them to create an environment where they could run to me. None of that had to do with my ability to cook. And when I could focus on the things that only I could do and I could leave the rest to the professionals, uh, that's where I was really able to step into the fullness of who I am. So some folks can hear this and feel like it's all on them to, you know, to try and figure all this out on your own. You don't have to figure this out on your own. There's folks who can come alongside you. There's professionals who do this day in and day out. So find someone who can walk this road with you. I am so grateful that we're ending on that note because I think too often this can be felt as a lonely venture. And if we can actually realize that there's a lot of resources and individuals that we can tap into, that is very helpful because it doesn't have to be alone and you don't have to feel as if you're on your own through this experience. So I appreciate you pointing that out. So here's what I'm going to do to wrap this up. Uh, Obviously, to our listeners, if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast. We'd love to have you subscribe and set your notifications to be notified each and every week of these new episodes that we release to help you work on your business and build the premier accounting firm in your area. In addition, we invite you to go to Universal accounting.com. It's there that we actually have in the podcast section highlights. This is essentially playlists that you can go listen to of relevant things that are related to the situation you're currently finding yourself in as it relates to your business, marketing, selling, mental health, client stacks, or tech stacks, staffing your agency. It's basically the things that matter most. Listen to the experts, hear what they have to say, and binge listen those areas. In addition to all this, we want to invite you to GrowCon. GrowCon is an annual conference. It's one that happens each and every year for 
for the owners of bookkeeping, accounting, and tax businesses. It's where you can come hear from the experts off the stage and actually learn what it is we need to be doing to work on our business. You get to interact with your peers and collaborate with those individuals that are committed to your success, as well as the staff here at Universal Accounting, people that are committed to help you be in business for yourself, but not by yourself with Universal Accounting. So right now, I encourage you to go and register, if you haven't already, to join us for GrowCon and make the most of what it is you can be doing to work on your business at this wonderful conference. In addition to all of this, I also want to invite you that if you would like to apply these principles as, uh, as well as others that we've discussed on the show, feel free to reach out to us. You can visit us at universalaccountingschool.com or give us a phone call at 801-265-3777. And always remember this, if it's about accounting, it is universal. Take care and be safe out there.